Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Do you like this accent okay? Yeah? That's good. How many people here put up your hand if you uh, have got Irish roots? Would you put up your hand? Oh, my goodness. God is in the house, I want to tell you. I'm convinced that half the world are Irish and the other half want to be, okay? That's all the journey that we're on. Well, it is a privilege for me to be here at Bayside. I'm taking part in the teaching series on Stronger, and I'm going to be talking to you about Stronger Purpose. I'm married, and I've got four children, and my youngest kid, Nathan, last year, uh, he announced this. He was only seven years old at the time. He just was sitting watching the television on the sofa, and he said, Dad, when I grow up, okay, I'm not going to get married. I'm just going to stay peaceful. And I said, son, you, you mean single? He went, no, peaceful. <clears throat> I don't know what that says about our marriage, okay? Uh, but peaceful is a very important thing. Back home in Northern Ireland, we have a phrase, okay? When we're a bit stressed out, we'll say, oh, give my head peace, all right? You can, you can work on that later, okay? <laughs> give my head peace, which is give me some peace. But I want to say the life that is peaceful is sometimes actually a little bit of a myth. True peace is actually found when we start fulfilling our purpose. Because you know what? You could be on the best beach in the world, you could have all your bills paid, and it could be very calm, but you would still have this gnawing call inside of your life, which is the purpose of God that He destined you for. And until you really start fulfilling that, okay, true peace doesn't come in. So I'm going to actually put peace, okay, or purpose before peace today, or the two definitely have a strong correlation. So what is it to have a stronger purpose? Well, for me, I believe that we were born for someone, okay? Now, I want to bring you up here with a quote. This is a guy called William Barclay, and he said this, there is two great days in a person's life, the day they're born and the day they find out why, okay? Now, I hope that you all know that you've been born. I hope that you all know that you're here, that you've got a body and a bit of a heartbeat, that you're in this place today, and that you all know your birthday. But I think actually more important than our birthday is our why day, okay? The day when we discovered why we were born. And this is this point that I just mentioned there. We were born for someone, okay? And our chief cause on earth and our, our, our most important purpose is actually finding our creator. Let me tell you some things about God himself, our someone, our creator. As a Christian, we believe that God created us that we might know Him. So some things simply about God Himself. First of all, He's involved. He's already involved in your life. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, well, I don't know God. I want to encourage you. He knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows the numbers of the hair on your head. This is what David says in Psalm 139. Before you even have a thought he knows it. That's pretty disconcerting, isn't it, everyone in this room? Okay, he knows your next thought. He knows what you're thinking right now, and he knows what you're about to think. God is that cool. He already knows you. He's already involved. He's involved in your life before you were ever born through the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to this verse here, Romans 5 and verse 8. It simply says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, everyone. While we were sinners, not when we were in our glam rags, not when we were looking so beautiful and so cool, not when we, when we had our tan and our beach body and our marriage was perfect. No. Actually, when everything was come, crumbling, when life wasn't doing good, when we weren't doing good, when we were at our worst, God did his best. Let me illustrate it this way. Listen to this story. A woman accompanied her husband to the doctor's office. And after his checkup, the doctor called the wife into his office alone. He said, your husband is suffering from a very severe stress disorder. If you don't follow my instructions carefully, your husband will surely die. Each morning, fix him a healthy breakfast. Be pleasant at all times. 
for lunch, make him a nutritious meal, and for dinner, prepare an, exp- uh, um, an especially nice meal for him. A lot of guys are going, where could I get this disorder, okay? <laughs> don't burden him with chores, and don't discuss your problems with him. It will only make his stress worse. Do not nag him, and most importantly, make love to him regularly. If you can do this for the next 10 months to a year, I think your husband will regain his health completely. On the way home, the husband asked his wife, what did the doctor say? He said, you're going to die. (laughs) Wise woman. (laughs) Irish blood in there, okay? (laughs) Said, you're going to die. Well, what has this got to do with what we're talking about? Well, God knew what it was going to take to help us to get better, to be absolutely transformed. And he didn't back off. He heard the diagnosis. He knew what was involved. And it was extreme. It was called the cross. And yet he did it for us. Such was his love. He's already involved in our lives. Another thing about our creator is simply this, that he's not lost. Sometimes Christians say this, I find God like God was lost or he was hiding, okay? God's not lost. The truth is that we're lost in life, okay? Now, let me put it this way to you. You know, you might be sitting thinking here, well, I don't really feel that lost. Actually, my life uh, has got great direction, and I've I've been recession-proof. I've actually come through this recession and the downturn. It's been an upturn for me. Let me say this here. It doesn't matter, you know, your economic status, where you're at in life. This is what the Bible says, that Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. And you know what? We're all lost outside of God. We're all lost. But where do we find God then? And how does he find us? Where's the meeting place? Well, three years ago, um, I had my family in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we made a very silly mistake. On a hot August day, I took my family to the Six Flags theme park, okay? And you know what it's like, the humidity over there. It was like a human barbecue. We were just all being rolled over and fried, okay? Okay especially the Irish, okay? We were dying out there. Well, about five o'clock, we thought, hey, we'd better eat. And um, we went up to the food court, but it just so happened that the whole of the park, they were thinking the same idea, okay? And, uh, and it seemed that everybody was there. I mean, the lines were back to Canada, okay? It was just <laughs> absolutely crazy. Uh, but as we sort of made our way through the fo- food court, listen, every parent, you'll understand what this is like. It was like a vision from heaven, there was a free table, okay? And I just threw my second boy at it. I just launched him at it. it was there. Dan was 11 years old. I said, guard that table with your life and this plastic spoon, okay? And just <laughs> ward them off, okay? And Isabel took our two youngest kids over to the side. There was a little Western show going on. My oldest boy, Ben, he really loves his food. So he came with me to make sure that I was buying enough, all right? So we walked to Canada, joined the line, and... Um, and we eventually, by sundown, we got, we got up to, you know, the, the food. We ordered our food, got it, and we brought it over to the table. Now, I knew the table. I knew that table. When you find a free table, okay, it goes, it's embedded in your memory. And I walked up to that exact table, and guess what? My boy wasn't there, but a healthy American family were there. And I just thought, they've eaten the Irish kid. <laughs> they looked at the line and thought, no, we'll just eat him, Okay. And I thought, oh, he must have got bored and just walked off and joined his mom over at the Western show. I went over to the Western show. He's not with mom. And there's just that moment of panic. Yes, every parent, that moment of panic where you're going, no, what are we going to do? His brother was delighted. He was thinking, I'm going to eat his burger. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but and I said, Isabel, suddenly it was like a revelation. I said, I know where he is, okay? And it wasn't a heavenly vision and God pointing, you know, under the roller coaster. It, it was, I tell you what it was. Wise parents know this. When we went to the park that morning, when we got through the gates, all the kids wanted to run to the biggest, fastest roller coaster. We grabbed them. We held them. And we walked them over to three seats that were there right at the front of the park. 
I said, if anybody gets lost today, I want you to come, wherever you are in the park, come back to the front of the park, find these three seats. See the middle seat? Not the seat to the left, not the seat to the right, but see the middle seat? Sit on the middle seat. Even if there is a lovely granny sitting on the middle seat, move her over. Sit on the middle seat. And so, in my t-shirt, in my shorts, and with flip-flops, okay, I started to run. How many people know what it's like to run with flip-flops on? That's an embarrassing video, okay? And I started to run with my flip-flops on. It was like, a, like a, a Hollywood movie. It was like Will Smith just running through and bouncing people off to the side. And I was running to the front of the park. I got to the front of the park. I ran to the middle seat. And guess who was sitting there? My boy. And it was like one of those Hollywood scenes. I love you, son. I love you, dad. Why did you leave the table? <laughs> Everyone, God has a seat. God has a place marked in history where we can find Him. And do you know what it's called? It's called the cross. God's not lost. God set up a location, a meeting point for every human being. Whatever your background, whatever your gender, whatever your religion, whatever your non-religion, whoever you are today, God says, I want to meet with you, and it's at the cross. And you might ask me and say, Andrew, but, but how do I find the cross? Do you know the cross is the easiest place in the world to find? Just fall to your knees and you're there. You want to find a cross? Just fall to your knees. And you will immediately meet with God. And I mean this not in a cliched way. He's quite literally dying to meet you. That's how important you are to God. So he's not lost. And the other thing is as well, he's extreme makeover. Everyone, I just want to put out like, you know, a health warning here. When you come to God, everything gets changed. Sometimes, you know, we treat life and God a little bit like Amazon.com. Do you know what I'm saying? You go online and then you go, uh, yeah, one middle class lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, add the basket. Yeah, I can afford that. Yeah, nice husband. Oh, yeah, he is nice. Yeah, add the basket. Okay. Uh, three kids, uh, add the basket. No, no, take one out. Two will do. And add the basket. Yeah, take the teenager out. And uh, add the basket, whatever. Yeah, little bit of Christianity, stroke God. Yeah, yeah, it's a bargain price. Add the basket. Everyone, God is the basket. God is everything. And when we come to God, it's extreme makeover. As you know, I'm from Ireland, Belfast. My father was born in North Belfast, and at 16, he joined the Royal Marines. He went off to be a man, you know, and, uh, and he did his best at that. He became the middleweight boxing champion of the Navy, and he got the tattoo. He traveled the seven seas, and he, he was quite the lad, as we would say, back home, okay? A hard man, that's what we say, a hard man. And... Uh, some good Irish coming through here today, okay? And, uh, but, but one night he was on duty, okay? And uh, a, a naval missionary came in. Well, all his mates scattered, okay? Because the God squad had arrived, all right? And, uh, and my dad couldn't move. And this guy talked to him about God. And my dad tried to joke with them, tried to argue with them. And a couple of weeks later, the same guy returned. And that night, my father became a Christian, everyone. He was 23 years old. Can you believe this? He just turned around. He, gave, he surrendered his life to God. And do you know what it was? It was extreme makeover. He said the next day when he went to curse, it couldn't come out. It just wouldn't come out. And he wasn't on a discipleship course or anything like that, you know, with the Royal Marines, you know, loving Jesus, getting a badge for it. It wasn't like that. Actually, and this is the extreme makeover, the spirit of the living God came into his heart. That's what happens when you become a Christian. You don't join Bayside. Actually, God sets up residence in your heart. Well, my father, he went home and told my mom, by this time he got married, went home and told my mom, and she was not impressed. Why? Because she was religious, okay? She had a lot of religion, but she didn't have much of Jesus. You know, it's possible to have that. And religion without Jesus is empty, everyone. And she resisted. Anyway, they, he left the Marines. They came back to Northern Ireland, and he joined the local police force. Now, that's a cool thing here, but back in that time in 1969 in Northern Ireland, our country was going into like a, almost like a civil war at that point. 
And serving police officers were actually targets for terrorists. And so uh, he, he went into a, a very tense job. And I can remember when I was about six or seven years old, walking home from school one day, and I came towards the house, and a neighbor came out and said, Andrew, um, you're coming over to me today because your father's had an accident at work. And what had happened was that this time he was a detective. He was out in plain clothes in an unmarked police car with his partner, and uh, they came across some um, bank robbers, okay? It was uh, guys that had just done an armed robbery. It was some terrorists fundraising, okay? And uh, they, they, they give pursuit to them. And basically, uh, in the end, these guys had to get out of a car, run away, and my father chased them. He had called them previously for backup, okay? And a police Land Rover came round the side. Two police officers were in the front. It was like this armor-plated vehicle. And by that stage in our country, things had got so bad, actually the military um, soldiers were on the street helping to police, okay? There was two young soldiers, and they were in the back, and they didn't know who my dad was. My dad had his gun out. He was saying, halt or I'll fire. The two soldiers saw this guy in ordinary clothes with a gun in his hand, and they thought he was a terrorist. One of the young guys, 18 years old, had the most powerful rifle in the world at that time, an SLR rifle with a high-velocity bullet in it. He fired it at my father from a distance of about 15 feet. It went straight into his chest, through his body, almost severed his right arm from his body, I left a, a hole the size of two fists in his chest on this side. And how he survived, we don't know. A Catholic priest ran out and gave him the last rites. So that's how bad it was, okay? But he, he survived everyone. It was incredible. It took months and over a year of convalescence. Then we had to move house again because of another security issue. And, um, but the first thing my dad did when he got back on his feet, he said to my mom, she called Betty, Betty, we're going down to church. And she thought, oh, okay, I'll go with you. And you know what? Within three weeks, she had given her life to Jesus after 10 years of resistance. She's a hard Irish woman, okay? <laughs> I want to say to you, that radically transformed our family. And everyone in here, I want to say that when you come to God, when you realize that you are born for someone, do you know what? It radically transforms your life. It is extreme makeover. So what happens then when you realize that you're born for someone? Well, the first thing that God does is He introduces you to this concept that you're born for something. You begin to realize, I'm on this planet for a purpose. I've met my maker, I've met my designer, and now I'm going to get involved in what He wants me to do. My someone is going to introduce me to my something. And right now, I'm going to embrace my calling. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Ephesians 2 verse 10. It says there that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now listen to this little line, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Everyone, he prepared in advance. We've got an organized God. How far in advance? Well, before you were born, he was organizing it. Isn't this really cool? This is what David says in Psalm 139. He says, when I was in my mother's womb, okay, he knit me together. Has anyone ever thought of God knitting? <laughs> Jehovah knitteth. I am the Lord that knitteth thee. <laughs> anyone in here knit? There's three guys over there with their hands. up. It's like a <laughs> little subgroup. Okay. <laughs> But the thought that God would knit us together and put us together, that's incredible. I mean, I'm just not talking about our physical frame. I'm talking about all of us. He puts us together and knits us with our personalities. He, he put Irish into me. Isn't that exciting? I mean, it's just a, a really cool thing, the thought of God doing that. And I just want to say this to you, that, you know, before you were here, there was a pre-you and God was thinking of you. And you got into this world with a plan. Let, let me just try and put it this way just to help you with this, okay? Now, I'm going to shock you right now, but I'm 42 years old. Yeah, you thought I was 52, okay. But anyway, I'm 42 years old, so just work with me here for a minute. About just 43 years ago, there was a moment of passion in the McCourt household, okay? <laughs> Are, are you with me, everyone? Now, now, look at me. I'm never going to make it on the Irish Olympic swimming team, okay? I'm never going to do it. I'm not Michael Phelps by any way. But I want to say that I went on a swimming race, okay, just over 43 years ago. I went on a swimming race. 
are, are you with me? If you don't know what I'm talking about, okay, just pray, just pray, just. And it was an epic, everyone listen, it was an epic swimming race. There was 300 million of us on it. <laughs> 300 million, look at me, 300 million. Whoa, we were in, okay, three, we're not talking eight lanes. Talking 300 million. Okay, 300 million, and we went off, and, and before you know it, millions had just backed out. They went, no, oh, it's too far, it's too far. But this baby kept going. <laughs> and so did you. Well, you weren't in my race, okay, but you were in a completely different race altogether. And then you came to these two tubes and there was a left and there was a right and you were going, move on. But you picked the right one. Maybe it was the left one, but I don't know. You got the right one. You got through. And everyone, listen, I won a swimming race. <laughs> and so did you. And you know, when we were born and we give our first cry, we still got a little medal around our neck, gold. Look at me. And maybe for you, the whole thought of birth, maybe for you, the whole thought of conception, you're going, I don't know what happened back there, and I don't, I don't even know who was involved. But I want to say this to you. Before even your mother and father had a thought of you, God was thinking of you. And you beat 300 million. <laughs> You've nothing to prove. God's got a plan for your life. And you know what God has done? He's put talent in your life. I really want to encourage you with this. There's talent inside of you. And he knit you together and he prepared you. He prepared you with talent. I met a man in a city where we planted a church. And his name was Paddy Doherty, okay? His nickname was Paddy Bogside. He came from the very poor area of the city. He was one of 13 children. And he managed to rise above. He became a civil engineer. And actually, Paddy, he rebuilt the inner city of the city of Derry, okay? Um, every single building that had been bombed during the Troubles, okay, he rebuilt. It was an incredible thing that he did for the city. And one time, a friend of mine and I, we were talking to Paddy, and he said, Paddy, what caused you to rise up? What caused you to do so good, Paddy, out of like one, being one of 13 children and the poverty that you had? What caused you? He said, it's simple. He says, when I was young, he says, my mother used to bring us to Mass. We didn't really understand it. He used to bring him over, and you'll see it here, to St. Eugene's Cathedral on the West Bank in Derry. And he says, my mom used to bring us there, and he says, most of the Mass was in Latin. He says, but the priest always read the scriptures in English. He says in one morning, he read the parable of the talents. I don't know if you know this story, but Jesus said there was a man, an owner, a master that gave to one guy five talents, to another guy two talents, and the last guy one talent. And he said, when I heard the story that day, he said, I thought to myself, and he said, and I said to God, God, before I die, I promise, just as a little boy he said this, I promise that I will double everything that you've given to me on this earth before I die. Isn't that incredible, everyone? And I want to encourage you, will you please start celebrating the gifts and the talents that God has put in your life? Everyone, this is a talent truth. They're not yours. The talents don't belong to you. They're not there to serve your ambition. They're not there to make profit for you. They're not there to extend your little kingdom. They're there to serve the purpose of God in your life. That's why God has given you talent. And you need to take your talent back to the owner and say, what do you want me to do with this? He wants you to double it. But you know, sometimes we back off. Why? Because we're looking at the five talent person. How many people are sickened by the five talent people? I mean, we love them a little bit, okay? <laughs> Five talent people. But, you know, let's just be, if you're a two talent, maybe you're only a one talent, I just want to say to you, whatever you've got, celebrate it. Look at these here uh, letters on, on the screen right now. W-R. Well, what's that? W-R in athletic terms is a world record. That's the five talent type people. And sometimes we're thinking, oh, yeah, I'll never break a world record. What's an O-R? Does anyone know what O-R is? Olympic record. You guys are pretty good at that, breaking those, okay? Olympic record. That's really cool. But you know what God wants us to focus on is PB. What's that? 
personal best, everyone. And you know, sometimes if you do your personal best, it can be an Olympic record or a world record, but stop fussing over world records and Olympic records. You know what God just wants you to do with the talents and the ability he's given you? Is your personal best. And that take a lot of pressure off your life. That's all he's going to ask you about. Did you do your best with what he had given you? And then training is really important. In our somehow, okay, we know, sorry, sorry, born for something. Training is really important. Billy Graham said this. He said, if I had one year left to live, if I knew I had only one year left to live, he said, I would spend six months of it in training and the next six months of it in activity. Training is that important. That's where your talents really get stretched. That's the point where you can start to double them. And then this begins to happen. When we get our talents and we recognize them, when we actually start to resource them, begin to release them then in life, do you know what begins to happen? Our lives begin to develop a theme. To say I'm born in Belfast and I come from the east side of the city, just where this great C.S. Lewis came from. He just went to school less than half a mile from us. And this is what he said. Every life is comprised of a few themes. I'm going to ask you, what's the theme of your life? You need a theme within your life. What's your theme about? Your theme's about your passion. It's what really drives you. It's when your talent matches your passion, your life theme begins to come out. On the screen here, you're going to see a picture of a guy called Eric Little. How many people have ever heard of Eric Little or seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Eric Little was known as the Flying Scotsman, okay? He was the fastest runner in the world at the 100 meters when he lived. He was due to run the 100 meters for Great Britain in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. He chose not to do that because at that time, the Sabbath issue in in Christian world was really important, and he felt, I can't run on a Sunday. Now, just forget about that issue for a minute. His main thing was he wanted to honor God as he saw best at that time. And so he said, no, I refuse to run on that day. I'm not going to do it. The British Olympic Committee, they were mad, and they said, well, there's a slot in the 400 meter, and you know what? That wasn't even his race or his discipline. He somehow got through to the final. He was drawn in the outside lane, which was the worst lane to be in. Listen, everyone, not only did he win the 400 meters that day, he broke the world record. Isn't that incredible? But this is what Eric Little said. He said, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Everyone, when I run, I feel a pain just about here. (laughs) Is anyone else with me? Wow, I feel my knees, and that's what I feel. (laughs) Because I'm not a runner, he's a runner. I'm going to ask you right now, when do you feel his pleasure? Is it, oh man, see when I'm sitting at that piano, sorry, this is playing the piano, by the way. See when I'm sitting at the piano, that's just, See, when I paint, I feel his pleasure. Do you know, I've got a guy in my church. He's about to leave Belfast. He's going to live in Dubai. He's a pilot. He's going to fly the Airbus A380, the largest plane in the world, the double-decker one. It's like a flying town, okay? You just get a town and stick wings on it. And this is what he said to me one day. He said, Andrew, when I fly, I feel his pleasure. God put talent in your life, Yes. He wants you to train. You can't fly a plane without training everyone. But you know what? You just develop a theme within your life. Do you know your pastor, Pastor Ray? I don't just say this because I'm in this church or standing here. He is an absolutely incredible guy. I really mean this. Thank you for letting him to come to Ireland and things like that and just letting him bless people. But you know what? Pastor Ray's got lots of talent. He's a great leader. He's a great communicator. I could keep going. But listen to this here. Pastor Ray, when I think about his life themes, you know what I think of? If someone said to me, what's Pastor Ray Johnson all about? I'd say, he's all about hope. And he's all about encouragement. And from his talents, he's able to use those things and fulfill those things. But 
But when I meet with Pastor Ray, I might be just running on the fumes of discouragement. But when I meet Pastor Ray, my tank is filled with encouragement. Five minutes with Pastor Ray, it's like a real blast of encouragement. Squeeze Pastor Ray, and he, you know, he just bursts out with hope. That's what he does. That's what his heart is. But this is my last thing here today. Talent's really important. Training. Oh, we've got to get into training. Life theme is developing. That's really cool. But this is the crucial one. It's called timing. The timing of God. How many people know that God likes to be late sometimes? <laughs> oh, it's so hard. And God says, I'm going to do something, but he hardly ever gives time on it, okay? Or an actual, oh, Lord, nail it, would you, for me? And are you like me? I don't like waiting. I just don't like waiting. If I'm in a line, I'm trying to look up and go, what's going on? How could we make this more efficient, okay? Trying to offer the manager advice, logistically streamline. I heard a guy recently say this, that... Uh, he was due for a dental appointment. The appointment was 3.30. He's a good guy. He turns up at 3.25. He sits and he waits. 3.30 comes. The time goes past. Eventually, at 4.15, the dental nurse comes in and says, it's your turn now, sir. He walks in, agitated, frustrated, <laughs> opens his mouth but wants to bite the dentist's finger. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he says, well, they're doing various things with his teeth. He has a little revelation. He said, I came on time, but I had to wait my turn. Everyone. It's our job to be on time with God. It's our job to use our talents, to be in training, develop life themes, but timing and our turn are with God. And listen to this, it's the attitude we adopt in the great waiting room of God that will decide our destiny. Yes, you've done your bit, you've been diligent, you're loving your wife, you're loving your husband, you're loving your kids, you're paying your mortgage, you're paying your tax, you're turning up at work, you're not taking false sick days off, you're doing everything right, you're, you're giving, you're generous with your money, and yet you still haven't had that breakthrough, you haven't come into what you really believe that you're born for. Do you know what? I'm just going to say this here, you're on time, you're doing everything right, but wait for your turn. Wait for your turn, and there will be a day, and you know what? You're not even looking. You're not even thinking. You've maybe even given up on something, and suddenly, through the destiny and the grace of God, He'll open a door, and boom, you're through. This is what the Scripture says, that He has made everything beautiful in His time. Yes? Yes? And that includes your life. And that includes my life as well. Can we pray this morning? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. I'm going to rewind. I'm going to go back to born for someone. If you're here and you're not a Christian, well, what do I mean by that? You've never had that moment in your life where you can put your finger on and say, that day, I decided to follow God. That day, I knew that Jesus came into my life. I just didn't attend church. It was, it was more dramatic than that. I didn't fall on the floor, but I know something happened that day. I made a decision. I'm going to say this here. Please, could this be the day for you? Maybe it's your first time in Bayside. Maybe you've been here a few times. Maybe you've come a lot, but you've never decided for God. But this day you're knowing, I know I was born for someone. Well, I'm going to say a prayer. And if you're saying today, I want to become a follower of Christ. I know I was born for someone, and I want him in my life. I'm going to pray this prayer, and I'm going to pray, and I'm just going to pray it slowly enough so that you can repeat it after me. You can say it out loud, or you can just say it into yourself. But if you want to become a Christian, just pray this with me now. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. It's like I fall on my knees and I come to the cross. I confess my sin. 
And I ask for forgiveness, your forgiveness, God. Would you cleanse me? Would you wash me? Would you take my sin away? Jesus, come into my life. Set up home in my heart. And I ask you not only to be my Savior, but I ask you to be my Lord and my God for the rest of my days in the name of Jesus. Could you please keep your head bowed and your eyes closed? If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, I'm going to count to three in just a couple of seconds. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I want you to pop up your hand after I hit three. Just pop it up in the air so I can see it. We've got a couple of stewards as well. They'll see it. No one's going to embarrass you. But put your hand up just clearly just to say, this day I know I was born for someone and I've made him my Savior and my God. So I'm going to count to three and then pop up your hand. Are you ready? One, two, three. Put your hand in the air. Could you do that? Thank you so much. It's great to see. That is great to see. Thank you so much. And before we move on, you can put your hands down now. Thank you. Before we move on, I'm speaking to every Christian in this room. I want to give you a bit of an appeal as well, just something to latch on to. And I feel that this is the important bit. If you're here and you know your talents, man, you've been in training and you're beginning to know your life theme, but you know rightly the key issue right now is the timing of God. If you're here and you're saying, I am surrendering my time to God. And I'm ready to wait my turn when God deems it fit. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet right now if you're going to surrender your time and wait for God's turn. Could you do that now? Could you stand to your feet? It's amazing. amazing everybody could you do this for me could you put your hands out in front like you're going to receive join with me in prayer dear God I receive your grace your grace that oils my life your grace that keeps me sweet your grace It doesn't wear a watch. It's not about dates, but it's about your presence. Dear God, this day, I say that your presence is enough. It's enough. I receive your presence now in the name of Jesus. Amen.